marimba, vibraphone, xylophone, and glockenspiel. Those four instruments are considered the main mallet percussion instruments in the band and orchestra setting. But what makes them each so different? And if I'm a teacher or a student, what's the important information I need to know about them? Well, in this video, I'll be breaking down all of the similarities and differences between these four instruments, as well as giving you all the details you need to know to be a better informed teacher or student. So consider this your guide to mallet percussion. And to get things started, let's talk about the basic layout of the instruments, which actually happens to be fairly simple because they're laid out the same way as a piano. All of the natural or white keys are laid out on the bottom and all of the flat slash sharp keys or black keys are laid out on top. All of this is done in a chromatic pattern, meaning that as you go up the keyboard, the notes get higher. And as you go down the keyboard, the notes get lower with each and every single bar. This is called a chromatic scale, which is different from major or minor scales because all of the notes are a half step apart as opposed to alternating whole step and half step patterns. Here's an example. All right, now with that out of the way, we're gonna be talking about a wide variety of things related to these instruments. With our main topics being mallet choices, range slash size of the instruments, octave displacements, and the bars and resonators. So to get things going, let's start with the mallets you should be using on each instrument. But before we can get into anything specific, we need to first talk about the differences between wrapped and unwrapped mallets. And starting with wrapped mallets, a type of material, which is typically yarn or cord, is going to be wrapped around a core, which is made out of rubber or plastic. These types of mallets are most typically used on marimba or vibraphone. And although you can use both yarn and cord on both instruments, yarn is most typically used on marimba and cord is most typically used on vibraphone. Now to talk about unwrapped mallets. And these are just like they sound, unwrapped. Now these mallets aren't necessarily just wrapped mallets without the wrapping, as there are some variations as far as size, hardness, and material. But you'll most commonly see these types of mallets being used on xylophone and glockenspiel. With xylophone most commonly being able to use rubber or plastic, and glockenspiel being able to use rubber, plastic, or brass. All kinds of sound capabilities. Every single mallet for each instrument can come in a variety of hardnesses as well, with some mallet series having numerous choices and some only having one. For example, you'll typically see a marimba mallet have five different options, soft, medium soft, medium, medium hard, and hard. And there are some variations on that with some series having a very soft option and some having a very hard option in addition to those main five. You'll also see some variations on words with xylophone or glock mallet sometimes being described as bright or very bright. Then to add onto that, there will almost certainly be variations from brand to brand as far as one brand's definition of a soft mallet being completely different than the other brand's definition of a soft mallet. That's what makes everything so unique and confusing. All right, now for the final thing to talk about for mallets and that's the shaft. Not in the sense that I'm giving you the shaft, but hey, here's a shaft. All jokes aside, your options for mallet shafts are either gonna be birch or rattan. There is a debate on which one is better as birch is gonna be very sturdy and have no flexibility while rattan is very flexible. But ultimately, it is up to personal preference. There are other shaft options such as fiberglass, but you don't really see that one being made anymore, if at all. Okay, moving on to the instrument's size slash range. And most commonly, you'll see the marimba at a size of four and a third or five octaves. There are different versions, such as the three and a half, four and a half, and 4.6 octaves, but four and a third and five octaves are gonna be the most common. And as far as the range, the four and a third octave marimba ranges from A2 to C7, and the range of the five octave is C2 to C7. Now for the xylophone, that instrument typically comes in sizes of three and a half or four octaves, with those specific ranges being F4 to C8 for the three and a half octave xylophone, and C4 to C8 for the four octave. And as you can see on the graphic, the top note for the xylophone is actually the top note of the piano as well. A nice little factoid for you there. Moving on to the vibraphone, it typically comes in sizes of three or four octaves, with some other lesser used versions coming at around 3.1 octaves. But who cares about those types of technicalities? For the three octave, the specific range is going to be F3 to F6, and then C3 to C7 for the four octave. Onto the glockenspiel, you'll typically see that instrument at sizes of two and a half octaves or three and a third octaves. The range of the two and a half being G5 to C8, 
and the three and a third being C5 to E8, which if you're following along on the graphic, E8 would actually be higher than the highest note on the piano, which is just crazy to me. Something important to note before we move on is that the two and a half octave Glock is most commonly used in the middle school slash high school level, and the three and a third octave Glock is most typically seen in the collegiate level. All right now, for this next part, I'm gonna be talking about the octave displacement of the sheet music for xylophone and glockenspiel. As when you read music for both of these instruments, you're actually not gonna be playing the exact literal note that you see on the page. Let me explain. On the xylophone, the notes that you see on the page are actually displaced by one octave, meaning that when you read C4, otherwise known as middle C on the page, the note you'd actually play would be C5. Another simpler way to think about it is that the notes sound an octave higher than they're actually written on the page. The same is true of glockenspiel, except for that instrument, it's actually a two octave displacement, meaning that when you read middle C on the page, you're actually playing C6. And for those asking, why on earth would they do this? It just sounds so confusing. Except in reality, you should be thanking them whoever them is, because if this wasn't the case, you would have to read a ton of ledger lines. I don't know about you, but I would rather not do that. And just to make it abundantly clear, out of the four instruments we're talking about today, the only ones where this is applicable is xylophone and glockenspiel. Marimba and vibraphone music is not displaced at all. All of this is ultimately important, so that way you know what the correct octave looks like on the sheet music and what octave you're gonna be playing in on the xylophone and the glockenspiel. All right, now moving on to the bars slash resonators. And to best talk about this, I'm going to divide the keyboards into two different categories, the woods and the metals. The woods being the marimba and the xylophone and the metals being the vibraphone and the glock. Starting with the woods, you can find both keyboards with one of three different types of bars, rosewood, paduke, and synthetic, with rosewood being the nicest and most expensive, because anything nice is always the most expensive. Both rosewood and paduke are natural wood materials, with synthetic being made out of, well, synthetic materials. Each company that makes synthetic bars has their own way of making them, with some companies using Keylon and others using Acoustalon. The big thing with synthetic though is that it's not affected by the weather, meaning that it's appropriate for use outdoors during marching band season. Rosewood and Paduke, however, would be greatly affected by the outside elements, such as rain and heat, as that would greatly affect their durability and tuning. So long story short, don't take a keyboard with wood bars outside, okay? Moving on to the resonators, which for those of you asking what those are, they're the pipes that hang underneath the bars, which affect the resonance of the instruments. Resonance is the vibration that happens within a space. And in terms of mallet instruments, it's what gives them their sound. Cause a keyboard without resonators would just sound dull and dry. Seems how there would be nothing vibrating and all you would get is a thud sound when hitting the bars because at that point they would just be pieces of wood. The resonators are also sized differently on each with the marimba's resonators being bigger than the xylophones. This difference is also why the resonance and timbre of both instruments are different. This, combined with how the bars are tuned, result in the marimba having a more full and warm sound and the xylophone having a more harsh and bright sound. Take a listen. All right, now we're gonna talk about the metals, which of course include the other two mallet instruments, vibraphone and glockenspiel. And just like last time, this next point is fairly obvious, and that's what the bars are made of, which is of course, metal. The colors of the bars are typically silver, but the vibe bars can actually be anodized into a gold color as well. As far as the resonators go, the vibraphone does in fact have resonators, but the glock, in most cases, does not. There are some models where the glock has resonators, but most of the time, especially in school scenarios, they'll just be in a box, which does act as the resonating chamber. Now, one of the things about a lot of percussion instruments is that we can't control the sustain. But what sets the vibraphone apart from other keyboard instruments is that it does have a sustain pedal. 
It functions just like a piano pedal, which allows the notes to resonate until the pedal is reapplied. There's a bar that has a long strip of felt on it that will dampen the bars when you let up on the pedal. There are again some Glocks that do have a pedal, but these are of course gonna cost more than the ones that don't. And again, these just aren't a common occurrence. All right, now that we've covered all of that, let's listen to the differences between the vibraphone and the glockenspiel. So we've talked about how the vibraphone has a sustain pedal, but it also has something else that makes it completely unique to all of the other mallet instruments, and that's a motor. By flipping a switch, you activate an electronic pulley system, which rotates the fan blades inside the resonators. In turn, this makes the sound it produces very wavy, or in more musical terms, it has vibrato. I don't know, I think wavy should be a musical term. You'll also be able to control the speed of the fans, which control the length of the vibrato slash wave effect either making it longer and wider or shorter and tighter. Let's take a listen. Okay, we're almost done, I promise. But there's one more thing I'd like to talk about, and that's the difference between graduated and non-graduated bars. If a keyboard has a graduation to the bars, it means that as the notes get lower on the instrument, the bars in themselves get wider to reflect the change. And in contrast, non-graduated bars don't have any change in their size and stay mostly the same. If you happen to be confused by any of that though, I actually just released a video going more in depth about the differences between those two. All right guys, we did it. We covered all of the information there possibly is to know about the four main mallet percussion instruments. Kidding. There's absolutely no way we could cover everything there is to know about these instruments in one video. And besides, that would be one heck of a long video, as if this one wasn't long enough. So if you think of anything else that you believe is important or want me to go more in depth on something, let me know in the comments and I might make another video about them. But I really hope this video was helpful as I believe that just having all of this information in one place as a resource will just be really beneficial to percussionists and educators alike. And hey, if you'd like to see more content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so that way you never miss another video. Until then though, I hope you have a great week and I'll see you in the next video.